my name is Jeff Dickinson and I'm from Oakwood, Illinois. I grew up in the Catholic Church and I would say that I went to church more because I had to than, than I wanted to. And then, of course, being made to do something the first time you get a little bit of freedom, you're, uh, you look for an excuse to get away from it, whether, it, whether it's right or wrong. My wife and I, when we came to First Christian Church, we tried a few different churches. Honestly, we're looking for a place to be a little bit more anonymous and less involved, uh, we thought. The experience was completely different here. Hearing the, the worship and praising God, listening to the sermons, it was almost like they were preaching to me. We were here about six months, and first baptism Sunday that I was here, Danny said that anybody who wanted to be baptized needed to meet him in the back of the church. I didn't hesitate. I practically jumped out of my chair and ran. I had been baptized and sprinkled as a baby, but you know, nobody understands that. I want to follow Jesus because when, when I started following Jesus, everything in life turns around. I mean, it's, you know, even little things. You don't imagine what things are like, or you can't imagine what things are like until you're, you have a relationship with Jesus. There is nothing else in the world like it. In my walk with Jesus, I have learned a lot of acceptance. Growing up in a different faith, growing up in a different religion, and even just out in the real world, there are so many times when people think that it's all about what you can do to make it to heaven and what you can't do to get to heaven. When you walk with Him, there is forgiveness, there's grace. There were times in my life when I looked at people and you know, didn't think that anything of them because they were a different way. They had a different view than I did. Maybe they believed different things. I guess I felt like well, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do. But I've learned that it's not my choice. It's not my job to judge them. It's my job to love them. Jesus, Jesus called us to love and we're all sinners, right? So just because you sin in a different way that I sin, doesn't make you a worse person than me. We're both sinners, and we're, we're both accepted by the grace of God. It wasn't very long after my wife and I started going to First Christian Church that uh, we both felt God tugging at us. We were living in a very extravagant house, driving very expensive cars, and when we started going to First Christian Church, we learned pretty quickly that we can't be a good witness to God doing what we're doing. Um, we were in the middle of a big kitchen renovation. We were building a, a very overpriced storage building. And I was outside working on that one day, and I just came to the realization that I didn't even want it. So uh, my wife and I decided together that we should try to live more humbly. So we downsized and changed our lifestyle, changed our habits, and got into a more, much more reasonable house. It still wasn't enough, so we're trying to take another step towards that. So we sold our house, and we're in the process of building a probably a little more modest house. We kind of felt like having payments every month was money that we could leverage towards other things, towards serving others. By getting rid of a car payment, now we can suddenly give more money to the church and, and, and serve more people that way. Everybody would like to have all their bills paid off, but we're not necessarily willing to give up things for it. I don't feel like I'm some awesome example or anything. I just feel like I'm trying to follow Jesus and do what I'm supposed to do. And that walk is not going to be the same for everybody that it is for me. It's I, I kind of feel like He's going to lead us all in a direction that He wants us to go. We all have different gifts. 
We all have different ways to serve. I can't say that my way is right and your way is wrong. I can't say that your way is right and my way is wrong. It's just different. I give back to God because He has given us the most awesome, unselfish gift that He could possibly give us. He gave us His Son to die on a cross for our sins. It, me giving back what I give back is nothing in comparison. But as we're taught, we can't earn that. We can't earn our way into heaven. We're given a gift and we can accept it and try to help and serve others the best we can. When God speaks to us, we have to learn to listen. And knowing something and actually doing it might be two different things sometimes. I might know that it's right. God speaks to us, we have to listen. And we have to not only listen, but we have to learn and we have to do what he asks us to do. And I don't feel like it's all that much to ask compared to what he's willing to give. My name is Jeff Dickinson and this is my story. The question was asked, if your church ceased to exist, would it be missed? The book was called Externally Focused Church, and it was asking a question about the local church of today. Does it really make a difference? Does it really impact the local community? Our neighborhoods and relationships transform because the people who call themselves disciples or followers of Jesus, do they really make a difference? You know, in the midst of COVID-19, we've actually gone through a season where we've had to kind of recalibrate who we are and how we actually function. And while we still gather for worship to, to sing and to, to break open the word, the way we function is much different. And people have actually wrestled with their faith. Some have seen great encouragement and others, their faith has stopped and become stagnant. The question becomes that we need to ask in many ways is, do we need the local church? I have some friends that answer this institutionally and they say, no, really all I need is God. I, I get what they're trying to say. But pragmatically, many of us say yes, because there are so many needs in the world around us, meaning we get that there is a correlation between those who have a relationship with God and the oppression needs and hurt in our community that Christ followers, Christians, should be the answer to that solution. We trust that God has empowered the church to make that difference. Now, if you call yourself a Christian, fundamentally, you believe that the body of Christ, the church, the people, really represents the hope to the world around us. Uh, when it comes to hunger, we provide food. When it comes to clean water, we provide wells. When it comes to caring for widows or orphans, we provide relationship and care for families. As Christians, we are called to be the solution to many of the world's wounds and needs. And for us, we realize that life is really made up of moments, moments of relationship, these divine appointments where God is inviting us to care for those closest to us. Moments then become movements. Movements are moments that are built up of divine opportunities that stir others up to join us to be a part of what God is doing. But movements of God's people, that is, movements bring meaning to the world that were around us. Specifically, God-led movements through the moments of God's people bring meaning to the life that we're a part of. That's why we're in this series called First Things First. We want to unpack what we value. And so as we begin to look at today and this value that we're going to look at, we need to wrestle with how should I be investing my life? What does my life matter? If, if the church would cease to exist, we would be concerned that there would be a great gap of need in our world that would not be addressed. We see great need. 
And if I'm a Christ follower, if I'm a disciple, if my life ceased to exist, would there be a void as well? It's an interesting conversation to sit down and think about our mission as a church. And we've tried to say, this is who we are as First Christian Church. We shared a new mission and it's this, helping each other follow Jesus. And that's really part of the challenge that we're looking at today is when we talk about our faith, it's not just about gathering together. It's not just about being in a room. It's not just about singing a song or even reading scripture. But the body of Christ should spur on one another and each one of us, whether we've just come to know God or whether we've been knowing God and living out a relation of faith for years, we're encouraging each and every one of us to be a loving community, to express outward compassion, to have a growing faith so that we can become the people that God has called us to become. Now, Uh, we defined what a disciple was in this process as well, because Jesus never used the term Christian, right? Jesus used the term disciple. And we define a disciple as someone who is actively loving God and others for the sake of advancing God's kingdom. Uh, Remember, we used the illustration of the chair, right? We started with this illustration of the chair that we believe that it can carry the full weight of my life. And just like that with our faith, until we firmly sit in the chair, until we fully place our life into the hands of Jesus, we're just beginning to think about who Jesus may be. But our faith requires that we place the full weight of our life into the hands of Jesus. So let's talk about where we're going to turn today. If you've got your Bibles, can you open up to John chapter 6? John chapter six uh, tells a message about Jesus that is one of the great miracles in front of thousands of people. Now, John chapter five, there's already some things going on. Jesus has healed a blind man, a man who's, Jesus asked, do you want to get well? A man who had been uh, blind for years and had been known for being in need. Jesus, of course, brings healing to him. And then there begins to be this question about the authority of Jesus. Is it okay to do what he just did, to heal on the Sabbath? And people get squabbling about, is it important to keep the Sabbath? Or is it important to meet the needs of those around us? And Jesus kind of calls out the the conflict and the hypocrisy. And Jesus begins to also talk, though, about the testimony of who he is. And he talks about the validation that he has before God and not needing the validation of man. And John chapter six opens up with what uh, many would call the miracle of thousands. It's a meal that's shared of just a few morsels that cares for thousands of people. Here's what it says, starting in John chapter six, verse one. It says this, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside. He sat down by his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Now here's here's the context. This is what's going on. Now, momentum is gaining. Jesus has done some miracles. Jesus has done some teaching. And the, the, the conversations are now stirring up that people are following after Jesus, following after a rabbi. Uh, this moment had started to become a movement and now Jesus is bringing meaning to why they are gathered together and who their identity, how they will be shaped as being followers of Jesus. Now, as Jesus is gathering this large crowd, there are needs that are arising. After people have been following for a while, people get fed, people people need fed, people are hungry, Uh, people are having all sorts of concerns. And Passover marks the season that many people are now beginning to gather to celebrate how God had delivered them out of Egypt, how the angel of death had passed over their threshold, over their household, because the lamb's blood was painted, was swiped over their doorpost. It was a foretelling, a a picture of the future of how Jesus would be our lamb who would die on a cross and his blood that was shed would bring our salvation. And so this is the context. The writer of the gospel of John is beginning to set up this miracle in the context of understanding people's need in the background of the Passover, God's deliverance for Israel now coming through Jesus. 
Here's what I need you to know when you understand this situation though. God's mission uses everyday moments to shape eternity. Jesus has taken an everyday situation where people are hungry, people are following, people are asking questions, and he takes this moment to begin to shape it, a normal day in life, to point to eternity itself. What we are about to step into is the real need that people have. People are hungry. And thousands have gathered around and the disciples are beginning to look around. His closest followers are going, how in the world are we going to help these people? Here's what it says, starting in verse five. When Jesus looked up, he saw a great crowd coming toward him. He said to Philip, one of his disciples, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test them. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. But Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have even a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus has now gathered his disciples. Thousands are out on this hillside and he kind of nudges his disciples and says, hey, how are we going to take care of this? Meaning Jesus recognizes that when there are needs around him, it's the disciples that need to figure out what to do. We need to figure out how to respond. One says, man, there's no way that we can take care of all these people. It'll take more than a year's salaries. I don't have that kind of money. I don't have that kind of ability. And we don't just have some sort of fast food restaurant anywhere just to get what we need. Another steps forward and says, well, hey, what we do have is this young boy's lunch. And so he offers it to Jesus. Now the passage says that Jesus, Jesus, was using this as a test. As a parent, I get this, right? There are moments when parents know what to do, but they encourage their family to figure out how to solve this because there will be a day when we're not around and they need to figure out how to live out their life. Jesus is entrusting his followers, his disciples, to now become the solution of the world because there will be a day that he's not with us. Uh, This food that was described, he says, here's a small boy. Uh, We're thinking it's some sort of commoner, but he's he's brown bagged lunched it, right? Brown bag lunch is when you just bring what you have to school instead of paying for it. It's a young boy. Some, Some commentators would say maybe it's a servant. He has five barley loaves. Barley loaves were known to be the the bread of the poor, two fish. Two fish, well, three, three fish were considered to be a full meal. So it's not even got quite everything that he needs. A few crumbs and a couple of fish. It's as if, remember those moments when your mom made your lunch, sent you to school, a bag of Cheetos, maybe a a thing of juice, peanut butter and jelly, right? It's an average ordinary person's meal. Nothing extravagant, not filet mignon. But what John is describing here is that even a young servant boy with his crumbs of bread and just enough meat to satisfy himself has what it takes to begin to be the solution here, right? That it's there that Jesus begins to do his miracle. It makes me think of it this way. Everyday people are invited to engage into God's mission. I need you to hear this right now. In order for the church to make a difference in the world that we're a part of, we have to recognize that God wants to use all of us. And there are some of us that think we are not good enough. We don't have enough. Only the pastor, only the wealthy, only the powerful. And Jesus is taking a young man a child, a servant, and elevating him 
to be part of the solution to transform the crowd around him. Here's what it says in verse 10. Jesus said, have these people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. They sat down, about 5,000 men were there. There are 5,000 men, plus women, plus children. Jesus then took the loaves, he gave thanks, and he began to distribute to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they, when they had all, all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Now gather the pieces that were left over. Nothing should be wasted. So they gathered them. They filled 12 baskets with pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. This is an incredible miracle, right? Uh, The gospel of John is beginning to create this portrait, right? Of how hungry people are provided through this miracle of Jesus. Matter of fact, if you read more of John chapter six, literally coming out of this, Jesus begins to take this moment and say, just like God delivered you from Egypt and provided manna or bread from heaven, I too am now the bread from heaven. I am the one who will be your sustenance. So John is bringing this whole miracle together, set in the backdrop of the Passover to remind those that are hearing, to remind those that are seeing that just as God has always been faithful, God has always provided, he has now provided Jesus, God in flesh. And Jesus is in fact the one that will give his life. Begin to see these young people, this young person offer just a small brown bag lunch begin to meet the needs of thousands. And we're reminded that everyday people experience eternity through God's mission. It's in these moments that we begin to realize, we recognize in this passage, I mean, the everyday need, right? We all know what it's like to be hungry, even if it's just for one meal, maybe just even being late. Nobody likes to be hungry or we become hangry, right? Everyday people, we we know what that's like to uh, feel like maybe we don't have much to offer. Uh, Maybe you grew up a white collar or blue collar or no collar, but there are moments in our lives where we all feel like we are not significant enough to make a difference. And Jesus is saying together in me, we are enough. And as the people of God, this should encourage us. This should inspire us. This should uh, spur us on to want to leverage our lives in the way of Jesus, that we too would give of ourselves for God's glory. So how do we begin to apply this miracle? And we see the needs. We see this moment that's arised. We see this movement that's playing out. We see the meaning begin to be expressed in front of us. But how do we begin to live this out even in our world? Well, let's, let's go through the three lenses. Can we do that real quick? The three arenas that we had talked about earlier. We've talked about establishing these values that we have, living them out on three arenas. And the first arena is this. It's the public arena, right? The community at large. Here's the question I ask when I look at this passage. Who is responsible for those in need? We live in a world that likes to say that our government can fix our world. We live in a world that likes to say it's just more education that'll fix our world. But to those of us who have a relationship with Christ, we know that transformation comes to the deepest portion of our lives when we come to know who Jesus is, when we surrender our lives. And so when we look at this question, it's of course, it's the followers of Jesus. We are the ones responsible to bring hope, to bring healing, to bring health to the world that we're a part of right now. A second question or a second arena I'd look at is the pew. How is the church then supposed to respond? I believe most of of us would say, well, it's through our personal surrender. It's through our personal sacrifice. That God's people learn how to roll up their sleeves and live out their faith in the relationships that are around them, at home, at work, and at play. And we would say that's what the church should do. So what about the third arena, the personal arena? (laughs) If we believe the church is responsible and we believe the church should respond through sacrifice and surrender, 
And personally, I have to ask the question, where am I responding? To God's mission and to the world's needs. You know, I think about this for a little bit as a church, we've been trying to get back together to gather and uh, there's been so much that's just been bombarding our church in a lot of different ways through COVID. There, there are all sorts of needs that are arising in our community. Uh, we get conversations with local school teachers needing supplies, uh, doing education differently than they've ever done before. We get conversations with different organizations or institutions, even mission partners who maybe finances have changed or maybe uh, things have shifted in this season. I mean, we think about uh, See You Better Together and how thousands of people needed meals and are continuing to need meals and we have supported and served there. I think about how our, our mission students have gone to Indianapolis and our, our middle school students were able to serve and to, to find different ways to impact that community and learn about how to step into a community and give of their time, give of their talents. You think about when private needs rise up around us. Just recently, uh, my phone rang and I, I had a conversation with somebody who said, this person at our work has lost their entire household of stuff. Can the church do anything? I think about my small business owner friends who are wrestling with how in the world do they keep their doors open when they were closed for so long? My, my, my question becomes, how do we as the local church make a difference? You know, the, the value that we're starting to talk about, and I haven't said it, it's this. It's life-giving generosity that we are people who joyfully seek to live generous lives. That's encouraging, isn't it? We're, we're the people that we seek to live generous lives. But the reality is when it comes to being a Christ follower, we've talked about this. We oftentimes settle for being a Christian rather than surrendering and being a disciple meaning we believe that the chair can hold us, but oftentimes we never fully place the weight of our lives into the hands of Jesus. And this value is perhaps the most challenging value for many Christ followers. Let me talk to you for a little bit if I can. Can we have a moment with Uncle Danny, right? I want to speak to you about a couple of things that I, I notice once in a while as, as we're in COVID-19. Uh, currently. As a church, both of our locations are open in Champaign and Urbana, 915 and 1045. We are hosting live watch parties, which means literally you come into a room, there's no live band, there's no live preaching, literally a screen is playing everything that we're a part of. And we've done that to prepare ourselves to be able to be live. We want to make sure that we were compliant with CUPHD and the Illinois Public Health Department. It's been great. We've had guests. It's great to hear the saints' voices. It's great to put our hands together and worship. It's great to open scripture and to be able to grow with our friends. But, but if I can be honest, we're all kind of hoping for the moment when we get a little bit closer to what the church is like when it's live. Can I tell you the single greatest obstacle to our church going live? It's volunteers. It's volunteers. In order for us to go live as a church, in order for us to provide children's ministry, to provide a full band and vocalists, to be able to live out the normal rhythm of our gatherings per location, it's volunteers. And the challenge becomes this. When we talk about life-giving generosity, we're reminded that disciples are called to go and to make. It's a sacrificial posture. But the reality is, oftentimes when it comes to believers in Jesus, we are more likely to sit and take than go and make. Friends, it's good to look at a passage like this because we all say, yeah, the church should be the first. Our church should be the people. The God's people should be the ones making a difference in the world around us. But as followers of Jesus, if we are more likely to sit and take instead of go and make, the world is missing out on the movement of God through our lives, through the moments of our lives being laid out, giving meaning to, to what their world is a part of. 
to let them see who Jesus is. So let me talk to you for just a moment. When we talk about generosity, what are we talking about? Let me make this real simple. God calls us to give our lives to him fully. But one of the ways that life-giving generosity is poured out is in our time, in our talents, and in our treasure. And I believe that God wants us to understand how to live out generosity in our time, our talent, and our treasure, not just simply one of them or two of them, but all of them. In our time, it's about devoting our time, our life towards God's will and God's people. Some of that's by being in his word. Some of that's by prayer. Some of that's by serving and giving up our time. Some of it's about gathering together and committing to gathering with others to spur one another on. It's about our talents. It's about taking the God-given abilities that God has given us and leveraging them for God's glory and God's honor. And you can do that in your time at work. And you can do that in your time at the gym. You can do that in your time with your family because your talents go with you everywhere that you go. Let's talk about the third one, the treasure. God also challenges us to give out of our resources. You know, there are, there are many of us who have done the Dave Ramsey thing, right? We've learned how to balance the budget. We've learned how to save up for an emergency. We've done the snowball debt, paying down things. But one of the values that Dave takes and talks about is, is it about our charitable gift, charitable giving prioritizing a generous spirit within our own financial management. And one of the things that I, that I recognize that in my own personal walk, it has been the discipline of giving that has grown my desire to be more generous before God and others. That oftentimes when we're holding tightly, our hearts never open to be leveraged by God the way they could be. Let me challenge you with this. So Jesus uses the illustration of a a brown bag lunch, right? A young boy shows up and says, this is all that I have. And I'll skip a meal so that others might eat. Nothing is more profound than when a child sacrifices so that others might have. It's a meager offering from a meager life. And God does a miraculous work. When we've gone through COVID, I've, I've heard people be creative about how do we help small business owners? How do we care for those who are on the front lines? How do we go out of our way? And I, can I just ask this? Have you asked the question, how do I help my church? I, I know when I think about my small business owners, you know what I do? I plan a meal that my family, we will we'll go, we'll get curbside, we'll take it home and we'll eat it so that we can help support and encourage the work of what's going on at a small business owner's restaurant or bar. But the local church, the local church, have we thought about it? The truth of the matter is we, the church doesn't need a building, but we have one. Uh, The church uh, doesn't necessarily even need uh, us to just open our wallets and throw it. But God is asked of us to surrender even our resources back to him. As 2 Corinthians says it this way, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Hey, let's be honest. For some of you, I've pressed in pretty hard today. But let me do something for a moment. I need to say thank you to to several families, to several individuals who have prioritized during COVID for us to be able to keep moving forward. Volunteers have showed up at See You Better Together. Students have continued to move forward in opportunities of service and ministry. Uh, The band has come in and every week given of themselves uh, singing and playing so that we can move forward. Uh, 
I mean, we've seen volunteerism, we've seen service, we've seen sacrifice, and we've even seen financial giving continue through the local church. And while we have diminished our budget, we've been able to steward so that we can still be generous and continue to answer the call and answer the needs of those around us. Here's my challenge for you today. If you've not had a chance to give of your time or talent or treasure, would you commit to do so today? Would you take a time out and just go to fcc-online.org forward slash Sunday and would you fill out a connect card? Would you, would you think about signing up to serve as a greeter or as a host to serve in kids ministry? Would you let your volunteer leaders, if, you're, if you lead a group or if you serve in a specific ministry, say, hey, I'm ready. I'm ready. I know that in this season, there's some of us that we're not ready to come back and we want to be sensitive to that. We want to honor and respect that. But if you're interested at all in continuing to get our church moving forward towards going live, will you come go and make disciples with us? Will you join us in this season? And if you have a chance to give, even as a household, Maybe today we begin to think about that. As a church, we use the Give app, G-Y-V-E, Give. We look up First Christian Church Champaign or Urbana, and we decide to give, to respond. Maybe it's a one-time gift. Maybe it's a, a recurring gift. You know, sometimes we go out on the weekends with our friends, and we buy drinks, and we don't think anything of it. What would it be like to make a commitment for like a small business owner? Or, 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 or to a, a ministry that you really care about, what, what would it look like for you to say, I, I want to give $20, $30 a month to make sure that the mission of our church continues to always be funded, to always be fueled. You could be a part of that. And God could take a meager meal, a meager offering, and do miracles through it to advance his mission. Now, why, would, why do we do generosity, though? Why would we sign up to serve? Why would we commit to give? Because this. Scripture reminds us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And in the Passover meal that's described throughout Scripture, Jesus takes a piece of bread. If you've got your emblems, you can join us in this moment. He took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. He said, take and eat. And in the same way, he took a cup filled with juice. He said, this is my blood. My blood poured out for you. Take and drink. As followers of Jesus, we eat the bread and we drink the juice because we believe God gave of himself that provide our life everlasting, that in Jesus giving of himself, forgiveness of sins and life everlasting was secured. Friends, when it comes to life-giving generosity, God has set the pace and God has invited us to join him in generosity. May each of us, through our time, our talent, and our treasure, take the moments that God has given us to become movements of his will in this world so that the meaning of God's sacrifice and love can be experienced by all.